chapter of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and recorded by St. Luke, Luke chapter 23. chapter 23, and I'd like to call your attention to verse 32. Luke 23, beginning with verse 32. There were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he's the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek. Latin and Hebrew. This is the King of the Jews. May the Lord's blessing upon his word may be sanctified in our hearts. You may be seen. I want to speak to you this morning from the subject of forgiveness and unnatural act. Forgiveness and unnatural act. Act. Forgiveness is indeed a very difficult and a very hard thing to do. Because long after we have said the words to someone who has offended us, I forgive you. And we've mustered up enough grace and enough courage and enough mercy to be able to utter those words. The pain and the scars of the offense remains. And we are often reminded of the original offense. Uh, the word resentment is derived from a word which means to feel again. Resentment, to feel again. And very often when we have been offended, we have been hurt, and we have been wounded, and if we allow it to go untended to, then resentment can swell up inside of us. And we start vicariously experiencing the pain and the agony of the event. And that's why you find there are some people who are really struggling, finding peace of mind and contentment. Because Paul says that we're not allow a root of bitterness to spring up among us. And resentment can result in a root of bitterness. And so you find yourself on a roller coaster, experiencing 
came for an act that occurred in some cases many years before. And that's why forgiveness is so necessary in the life of believers. If we're going to experience the fullness of joy, if we're going to experience the ecstasy and the excitement that God would have us to experience as those who have been forgiven, then we too must learn to forgive. Behind every act of forgiveness, there is the bitter wounds of betrayal and pain. Can you imagine the pain that Jesus felt? after having spent three and a half years with those 12 men whom he called apostles, and one that had sat with him at meal, who had supped with him, who had prayed with him, who had fellowship with him, Judas Iscariot, would sell him out for 30 pieces of silver, would sell out the Son of God, the one who had only uttered words of grace and mercy and truth, the one who tempered every single word that he spoke through the filter of the grace of God. When I consider the Lord Jesus Christ, God in human form, John refers to him as the one that was full of grace and truth. And we talked about that a few days ago, that since Jesus was full of grace and truth, every word that he spoke was tempered with grace and truth. Every deed, every action was saturated with grace and truth. Yet this one who only spoke words that ministered grace this one who only spoke the truth and nothing but the truth, was sold out by a close friend for 30 pieces of silver, was lynched by an angry mob who were crying for his blood. You know, Calvary, it was nothing more than a lynching. The crucifixion of Jesus had nothing to do with religion. The crucifixion of Jesus had everything to do with power. And who was going to wield power in Palestine? The Pharisees, the scribes, and the chief priests not only were they the religious brain trust in Israel, but they were also the political power. Yeah. Israel being under the rule of the Roman government would often allow their subjects to maintain much of their own culture and their heritage and much of their system of religion and of self-governance as long as they would pay their taxes to Caesar and as long as they would honor Caesar. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the chief priests and the scribes had became major religious, political, and economic powers. And so when Jesus came on the scene, the masses of people started to follow him because he taught with such profundity, not as described in the Pharisees, the Bible says, but as one having authority. And the truth of his words, the veracity of his words, the power of his words, it found fertile soil in the hearts of the masses of people. And so when the religious establishment saw that the masses of people were following Jesus, they felt that their power base was threatened. So those who otherwise did not confederate, fellowship, collaborate, came together, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they joined venture and they agreed on one thing, Jesus has to go. He has to go. And so this, this righteous man sold out for 30 pieces of silver, betrayed to be crucified, led down the Villa Della Rosa to a place called Calvary, and nailed to the cross. The cross, this emblem of suffering and shame, the cross, this symbol of humiliation and death, the cross, this tool of torture, the cross, this instrument of crucifixion, the cross, the symbol of death. On Calvary, Jesus took the symbol of death, humiliation, and shame, and he turned it into a symbol of hope. And so today, the cross, it symbolizes the hope that we have, that we have been forgiven. Amen. And the fact that the cross is empty is proof positive that Jesus was buried and raised from the dead. Only Christ could turn the symbol of death and destruction into a symbol of hope and possibility. That's the power of God. Amen. That's the power of God to intervene in space and time and change the ambiance and the environment. Only God and it all emanated from his love. In the text, in Luke 23, he said, they came to the place called the skull, verse 33, and there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. And then the King James, you missed this. The words to 
Bible say, and then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. It is translated from a Greek tense, the imperfect tense, which the literal translation should have been, and he was saying, but Jesus kept on saying. He did not say, Father, forgive them one time. He kept on saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He kept on saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Even though no one had repented and cried out for mercy, the text says he kept on saying, Father, forgive them, because they know not what they do. Now, what was he talking about? He was talking about his own crucifixion. That they did not know that they were crucifying their only hope. That they did not know they were lynching the only possibility for salvation. That they, that they did not know that they had the audacity to take on God himself in human form. So what he is saying, Father, don't hold this act right here against them. Because with all the sin they have in their life to give account for, with all of the treachery in their soul, they one day and give account for it. Don't hold this act against them. Don't hold this act of my death and my crucifixion. Don't hold this act against them. This is powerful. Because in the heart of God, in the heart of God, there is forgiveness. The forgiveness of God, it flows from the heart of God. The word forgiveness comes from a word which means to, to cancel a debt or to free up to liberate, to let somebody go. And so Jesus was saying, Father, don't hold this against them. Don't hold my crucifixion against them. In the heart of God, there's forgiveness. There's forgiveness for you. And there's forgiveness for me. And some of you have lifted your tired, weary souls from your beds this morning. And it took every ounce of strength and energy you had to dress and to get here. You felt that you needed to come and at least ought to go on Easter. And we're so grateful to God that you did come. Because sin has so warped your perspective. And you have been held hostage by so many other people that you have offended. And you've never heard them utter the words, I forgive you. And you think about the wretchedness of your own life, the trauma that haunts you in your soul, the sense of guilt and shame that you go to bed with and that you wake up with and you wonder, is there any hope for me? Is there any hope for me? I just thought about to tell you, there's hope for you. Because of what took place on Calvary, there is hope for you. Because of the death of Christ on the cross of Calvary, because he shed his blood there, there is hope for you and there's even forgiveness for you. There's even forgiveness for you. And you're saying, but preacher, you don't, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I did last night or yesterday. Preacher, you don't know how, how I lived my life, how wretched my life has been, how many people I have offended. You know how I dishonored my own mother and my father. I've engaged in sins that I even thought I never dreamed that I would engage in. You don't know the guilt and the shame that I'm living with. I just thought to tell you, there's hope for you. There's hope for you. The cross is a symbol of hope for you. For in its very design, there's the horizontal beam of the cross. In its very design, the vertical beam, I should say, the vertical beam of the cross, it looks toward heaven. It lifts up toward heaven. It lifts toward heaven where the hope is, the possibility is, I heard the psalm that says, I will lift up my mind to the hills from which come my help. The cross points toward heaven where there's hope and there's help and where there's healing. And then there's the horizontal beam on the cross. And it stretches as far as east to west to the uttermost it reaches. And it's, it, it embraces sinners, tired and weary. That's why Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor, and I have you laid, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light, and you'll find rest for your soul. How long are you going to labor under the burden that you're under? How long are you going to walk around all day with guilt and shame and humiliation? How long are you going to run to the restroom to wash your face, to try to wipe away your tears? How long are you going to try to camouflage the guilt and the shame and the humiliation that you're experiencing with designer clothes and new jewelry? How long? How long will you labor on this heavy burden called sin? How long? There's hope for you. There's hope for you on the cross. It's hope for you. 
You know, when Jesus was hanging on that cross, in John 12, he said, And if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I draw all men unto me. He was suspended between heaven and earth. And though when Jesus was suspended between heaven and the earth, he literally became a spiritual canopy. Paul writes in Galatians 4, he says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem them who were under the curse of the law. Now I want you to understand what Paul was saying. When Christ came, the fullness of time, the wrath of God was being prepared to be poured out on humanity. God was going to judge the world, but in the fullness of time, he sent his son, the Lord Jesus, and he drank Jesus over us. And so the wrath of God is poured on the earth, but he can't get to the earth because Jesus is suspended between heaven and earth. And he's the canopy there. He's a spiritual force field. He's catching the wrath of God. That's why Isaiah said, it pleased God to wound him, to bruise him. It pleased God to bruise Christ, to wound him. So in bruising Christ, in wounding Christ, he did create an economy whereby he could forgive us. Oh, there's hope, and the cross speaks to hope, and the cross speaks to possibility. That salvation is possible. That forgiveness is possible. That God is not some sadistic cause that kills joy, waiting to zap us when we step out of line. No, God sent his son, the Lord Jesus, who got up off the precipice of his eternal reign, left aside his royal diadem, walked through 42 generations, took on the form of a man so he could go to the cross of Calvary and die as a sin substitute. That's the God I want to tell you about. This God whose mercy is long-suffering, everlasting to everlasting. This God's mercy and grace that can never be exalted. This God that offers you an opportunity to come into his kingdom. There's room, there's room, there's room at the cross for you. The cross speaks to God one time, in time declaring that I'm providing a way that people can be saved. Cross. It symbolizes hope and forgiveness. So Jesus instructs us that we ought to forgive. So we can be sons and daughters of God. That we might imitate him. That we might emulate him. And that people would come to the conclusion that we have come to know him because we act like him. You see, forgiveness requires you to step over your, the wounds in your heart. They're real. The real hurt and pain, disappointment, a betrayal, a rejection, it's real. But, but, but forgiveness says, no, I'm going to step all over this cloud here. And I see a more excellent way to live and not to hold a grudge and not to be bitter and not to be resentful. But I believe that when Jesus hung on the cross and died, he died for my sin. And he put, filled my heart with love and now he gives me the capacity to forgive. And so I can now cancel people's debts. I can now look over people's shortcomings. I can now say I can forgive you even if you don't ask for forgiveness. Because the love of God has been shed broad in our hearts. There's a story that I read this past week by an author by the name of Victor Hugo. And Victor Hugo writes a story about a criminal by the name of Jean Valjean, a notorious criminal. And Valjean had spent much of his teen years and adult years incarcerated. And finally, he was released from prison. And there was only one advocate in the community that would provide for him a solace, this innkeeper. So he brought Valjean into his home, and he treated him with royalty gave him the master bedroom, access to all of the amenities. And one night, the true nature and the true character of Valjean came out. And so while the innkeeper was asleep, Valjean ransacks his house, takes the fine china, takes all of the silverware, all of the jewelry, and he leaves. He escapes. But the police calm him down. And they bring him back to the innkeeper's home. And when they bring back Valjean, he has the sack with all the stuff in it. And the police pours all of the china and the silverware 
and everything out on the floor. And he says, is this yours, sir? And the innkeeper says, oh, 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 Mr. Valjean, you forgot the candlesticks. You forgot the candlesticks. The innkeeper said, all that I have is yours. Take the candlesticks also. And the innkeeper refused to press charges. He'd already forgiven Valjean. That's what Jesus did. That's to illustrate what he did. Though we have taken from him, we violated his righteousness. We sinned against his love and his mercy. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. And do what we thought we could do, we can do it our way. But when we show up at Calvary, when we show up there, he says, take the candlesticks also. Because I have canceled your debt. I have forgiven you. Your slate is wiped wipe clean. That's the God I want to tell you about. That's the God that you need to come to know. And I don't care what your socioeconomic status, political status might be in society. You need a savior. Amen. Amen. You need to know that, that, that your soul has been cleansed. You need to know that you experience forgiveness of your sins. And that you will not have to stand before holding a righteous God in judgment to give account for your sins. I have the highest regard for people who don't know Christ. The highest regard. Because I don't see how they make it. I don't see how to deal with all the uncertainty of life on a day-to-day -day basis. Life is serious business. And none of us have a crystal ball that we can go and rub and look into and see how things are going to turn out tomorrow. Life is serious business. It's filled with, with potholes. The terrain is uneven. The, to the, the topography is uncertain. And for the life of me, I can't figure out how people can live without Christ, not knowing what the next minute might hold. Not knowing when they get in their automobile, whether or not they're going to be hit by an 18-wheeler. Not knowing whether or not when they wake up tomorrow morning, maybe they might be blind, crippled, and insane. How can they live like that? How can they live think they can wake themselves up every morning and get themselves up every morning? I have the highest regard for those who live without Christ. But one day, one day as your golden moments rolled on, after a while and by and by, you're going to find yourself between a rock and a high park place. You might be slick and have tremendous finesse. And I've told you before about my grandmother who raised me. And I didn't like to want to study. I preferred to play basketball. And I told you I used to sleep on my books. And she said, boy, that ain't going to help you. <laughs> and she would say, son, you can't make it through this life with your charm and your good looks. You got to put something between your head. Now, some of you got a lot of charm, and you got a lot of good looks. Much education, much sophistication. You're street wise, but after a while, there will always come a situation or a circumstance that you can't handle, that you can't maneuver your way around, and you're going to need a God. That's the one I want to tell you about. The one that you can come to know today, right now, where you sit as your personal Savior. The one who will fill your heart with joy unspeakable and full of glory. The one who will forgive your sins, not tomorrow, but today. And give you hope and purpose and meaning and direction. And so your life will take on some significance. And it will be more than just an endless, disconnected bunch of events. But you will see that God does have a wonderful plan for your life. And he himself has a choreographer. He might bring you to himself without spothering. This cycle that you are in, if you don't know Christ, and this cycle that you're in, if you know Christ, and you allow bitterness to spring up inside of you, it can only be halted by forgiveness. Forgiveness offers a way out. The husbands and wives, you can't make no progress. You are a stalemate. You literally a logger jam. Because you've come to the crossroads where someone has to say, I've got enough God in me that I can forgive. That's the only way you break the cycle of dysfunction and confusion. When someone can say, I forgive. Forgiveness loosens the stranglehold of guilt. Guilt will strangle all the life out of you. You will be suffocated by guilt. Many of the people have psychological problems. They're really dealing with unconfessed sin. They know there's something wrong. And no matter how much people tell them everything's going to be all right, they know that everything is all right. Because the Spirit of God has brought conviction in their heart. Only forgiveness can break the stranglehold that guilt has on your life. Human beings.
hens are the only species that know intellectually that they are dying. Animals know it instinctively. We know it intellectually that we're dying. But we live in a state of denial. We live in a state of denial. We will not face the ultimate truth that the ways of sin is death, the gift of God's eternal life. We will not accept the truth that it is appointed unto every man, woman, boy or girl wants to die. The inevitable appointment that none of us will miss, nor can we escape. We're the only ones who know it intellectually, but live in denial. I just stopped by the tell you it's time to break the cycle of denial and to face the reality and the truth of your own humanity and to realize you need a relationship with the living God. Not only does forgiveness hold the cycle and loosen the stranglehold of guilt, but finally, forgiveness breaks the cycle of blame. We're in this blame game. It started back in the garden. When Adam disobeyed, Eve disobeyed, it started back there. When Adam, when God showed up to deal with Adam, and the first thing he said, Lord, it was the woman you gave me. I was doing fine, and then you brought me that woman. I was doing fine until I got married, Lord. And the woman said, no, it was the serpent that did it. He beguiled me, he tricked me, and this blame game started back in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, and it's been perpetuated ever since. At some point in time, we've got to halt this blame game. We gotta halt this blame game. And those of us who, who live in certain communities, we never wanna take responsibility for ourselves, for our own actions. Only forgiveness can halt the blame game. And everyone trying to pass the buck, and we ultimately accept responsibility for our own sin. And realize that the confusion in my life is not because of what my mama did. Some of y'all need to let your moms and dads go. Some of your mothers and fathers are dead in their graves, and hopefully in heaven, and you're still holding them hostage with unforgiveness. You're still blaming them because they didn't give you this, but do that for you, take you, take you that. Because they treat you this way or treat you that way. You owe them regardless of how they treat you because you're still here. And whatever you went through, it didn't kill you. So God had a plan for it to bring you to a point in your life where you can realize that he was in it all. He was in it all. He was in it all, all the hurt, all the pain, that he's been in all of that also. And he's brought you to a point to where he can apply his healing balm of forgiveness. Jesus kept on saying, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. But you know, sometimes we know what we do. Sometimes we know what we're doing, don't we? And we know that we're sinning against God. And we know that we're violating righteous standards of God. And whether we know what we're doing or don't know what we're doing, there's still forgiveness in Christ. That's what John says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to keep on cleansing us from all sin and unrighteousness. That's what I'm talking about. Even when we know what we're doing, God still extends his hand to us, extends his hand of forgiveness and mercy and a pardon. That's the love of God. That's the story of Easter. And as we celebrate on this resurrection morning, where we commemorate the resurrection of Christ from the dead, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ was God's profound pronouncement that I am satisfied with the death of my son. And whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. Yeah, yeah. And though the sands be as scarlet, I'll make them as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. Come, God says, come, let us reason together. Let us reason together, God says. And let me take your raggedy, dysfunctional life and let me put the pieces back together again and make you a trophy of my grace. He says, come, come, come let us reason together. God is a reasonable God. He's not an unreasonable for God. He's wanting to exchange your guilt for his forgiveness. That's the God that I'm talking about. And you might be at the end of your rope 
and you might think there's no hope. Situation is so bleak, you don't see how even God can turn it around. I just dare you to trust him today. You gotta get sick and tired of being sick and tired. You can't keep going in the wrong direction and think things are gonna self-correct. It just doesn't happen that way. If you're going north and your destination is south, I don't care how fast you press the accelerator, you're not gonna get there. You gotta stop and make a U-turn and go back the other way. You can't keep going in the direction that you're going in now and expect it to self-correct. And having self to correct this long, what's gonna change? You need Christ as your personal Savior to forgive you, to fill your heart with joy and peace and purpose and give you a sense of mission. There's someone here this day, today, maybe you are a Christian, but somewhere along the way you got sidetracked. As Paul said in the book of Galatians, someone hindered you, something, something tripped you up. I can think of no better day than today to recommit your life to Christ. To decide that today, this day, April the 15th, 2001, I surrender to Christ. I sign a contract that I'll be a slave of Jesus Christ to serve him. He might take this raggedy life of mine and do something of significance, importance, and to have eternal value. Don't you want the dash to mean something. You know, I just buried my dad. And I walked through the cemetery. And I saw all these people from my little community that I knew as a boy growing up. And you know, my heart was filled with a lot of joy as I would see certain individuals, see their name, they're born 1900, dash 1985. And I could interpret that dash. I saw one of my school teachers grade taught me how to read. That dash meant something. I saw men from the community the neighborhood that gave me a good word. The dash meant something. But there were some graves I came across. When I looked at the dash, I could not think of anything good that took place with the dash. Jesus Christ will make the dash mean something. We all leave it here. The seeds of our own destruction is flowing through our veins right now. Sin that infected our first parents, Adam and Eve, has been passed on to every generation. It's like a time capsule. Some disease is going to take you out. It's going to take me out. Cardiovascular disease, cancer. Something's going to take you out. What will the dash mean? Will it have any significance? How will people interpret it? If you want the dash to mean something, I encourage you to swing your life to Christ today. Let's bow together, shall we? Father, we thank you for this time to be together this morning, this Easter Sunday morning. Thank you for the sacrificial substitution of death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died in our place, took our punishment, that you might grant to us forgiveness and a pardon. Forgiveness that breaks us and halts the cycle of sin. Forgiveness that loosens the stranglehold of guilt and shame. And forgiveness that breaks the cycle of blame. Speak to that heart this morning who needs to hear. I need to hear from you. To know that you are God who has not forgotten them. You know their pain, their struggle, their anxiety, their frustration. They need to hear, Father, that forgiveness is available. All they need to do is cry out, Lord, have mercy on me, sinner. Forgive me. And you'll grant them a pardon. Whatever the spiritual need might be, I pray that you would speak today. To those who never come to Christ, maybe the day they would say, yes, I want to be saved. Those who are saved and not living for you, they say, yes, I will live for Christ. And maybe there's someone looking for a church home so they can grow and be accountable. They can say, yes, I want to be in this place. Speak, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye still closed. There's someone here this morning 